You're listening to the A Connector podcast with host Mark Foreman. Let's get connecting. Yeah. I want to welcome our guest today, Mr. Eric Mencher. Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Okay. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, just to let the audience, uh, so the audience knows, I disco- discovered Eric's photography over on Instagram and uh, really liked it. Had yeah, I've made some comments back and forth, so I had a little bit of contact that way. And then um, once I got the podcast going again, I just really decided, well, you know, I really like this guy's stuff. I'd like to find out some more about him. And so here you are. Yeah, here I am. <laughs> okay. And why don't you tell us where where is there exactly? Well, right now I'm in Philadelphia where okay. I've had a for over 30 years. Um, the last 10 years I've been living a good part of the year in either Guatemala or Mexico. But okay. came back to Philadelphia in March and... Um, this is where I am and probably will be for a while now. Okay, so uh, pre pre COVID was 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 Guatemala were Guatemala and Mexico regular yearly visits or how, how did that all start? Um, yeah, about ten years ago, my wife Cass and I went to Guatemala for the first time to study Spanish. We'd been going to Spain pretty regularly okay. once a year, mm-hmm. and. It would be nice to actually learn the language. So we went to Guatemala to learn Spanish once and for all. So then we could return to Spain and show off our new Spanish skills. And we fell in love with Guatemala, didn't really learn the language, and haven't returned to Spain. <laughs> okay. So most been in Guatemala, though. We've Although we spent close to a year and a half in Mexico, too, in the last five or six years. Do, do you have a preference between the two places or... Well, they're both very different. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to say that Guatemala is spiritual and Mexico is magical, but I think we have um, a real solid group of friends in Guatemala. The culture there is fascinating. It's an amazing place to photograph and just to live. And I think overall we feel more comfortable and more joyous being in Guatemala than Mexico, but you know, both both are interesting in their own distinct, unique ways. Sure. I, I've been to uh, Mexico myself. I, I lived in uh, Tucson, Arizona for almost 11 years. So that's mm-hmm. pretty close to the northern border. And uh, probably the furthest south I've been is just, you know, again, still pretty far north uh, in Sonora. Uh, down, uh, let's see, was it on the, not the Gulf side, but the um, Sea of Cortez side. So that right. would be... That would be between Baja, California, and the, I guess the western, uh, the western side of Mexico, <clears throat> and uh, but never, never that far down. Now, let me ask you: so, in Guatemala, are the indigenous people? Would they be Mayan? Yes, okay. they are Mayan. <laughs> so it's a it's a more it's a more pronounced Mayan culture, Mayan influence there. Then it is, yeah, uh, the Mayan culture now extends a little bit into Mexico, not not a lot, but um, it's mainly in Guatemala, about fi- roughly 50% of the Guatemalan population is Maya. Okay. I, I do have a, a few friends here in Taiwan that are actually Taiwan-Guatemala mix. So that, oh, wow. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. And, and also, too, because I believe, and I think science would kind of indicate that most uh, – uh, most New World indigenous peoples probably did come from Asia originally, so you see some definite. You know, they don't look they don't look like cousins per se, but you definitely see some Asiatic resemblance. I, I actually had a situation where, when I was in college, one of my buddies was Japanese, and we went down on spring break to Mexico, and all the Mexican kids were pointing him, "Oh, China, China," and of course he was Japanese and not Chinese. But the interesting thing was I could I could see some resemblance between Yasu and, 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 you know, some of the local kids. You know, you could see that, you know, there's some kind of Asiatic, uh, you know, feel around the eyes and whatnot uh, with the indigenous peoples. And I'd say even with uh, Na- Native Americans in North America, the U.S., 
you know, just the straight hair and, uh, you know, I, I see other cultural uh, parallels and similarities. I don't know how you feel. Um, I would agree with <laughs> what you said. Okay. Okay. Uh. So, all right. Uh, just out of curiosity, I mean, do you, is like Guatemalan cuisine similar to Mexican or, I mean, is it pretty unique or? Um, it's very different than Mexico, the, the food. Guatemala food is pretty bland. The amazing thing is that they grow everything in Guatemala. I mean, it is so fertile. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I think Mexico has a real strong culinary tradition and younger chefs are building on that and doing amazing things. Right. Well, that's just starting to happen. Um, Guatemala, one reason it's so fertile is because of volcanic ash. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. So there are definite growing seasons, like I believe right now, for instance, is mango season. So things come and go, but right. oh my God, yep. quality yep. of the taste of the food. When I come back to the United States, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so bland by comparison. The actual, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, is. yeah, there's other reasons for that too, because, you know, something fresh in the United States is like maybe five or six days old, whereas like probably in Guatemala fresh is like from the, from that morning, it was harvested that morning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, kind of like Taiwan as well. And yeah, we, one of our favorite restaurants, we asked the owner, it's like, why do your avocados, you know, taste so good? And he says, well, like, this one just fell from the tree today. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, you know? the, that's the best way for sure. So yeah. that, that's a nice thing to get used to. I mean, you wow, you could really taste the food. It's really got a, a vivid, uh, vibrant, full flavor. So, uh-huh. What, yeah. What it, about the population exactly. down there? I mean, is it a fairly big country? I'm, I'm guessing it, it can't be too big, but do you have any idea what the population of Guatemala would be like? I believe the population is 18 million, okay. roughly. That's, so, not, that's not small, small. That's that's only a little bit smaller than Taiwan. Taiwan's about 22, I think, 23. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, it's not that... Um, densely populated. I mean, Guatemala City is huge, and I'm not sure the exact numbers of people who live there, but it's it's a pretty rural country, too. There are only three or four or five bigger cities, mm -hmm. and then there are smaller ones. Like, um, we, we would stay in two places, typically. There's a gorgeous lake called Lake Atitlan, yes. which Huxley, the writer, said, um, well, supposedly he says it's the most beautiful lake in the world, but what he really said was it's too much of a good thing. And it's just stunning. Does, it's does it have a volcano uh, next to the lake or in the back uh, background somewhere? Got three volcanoes. Oh, okay. um, all inactive. Because I think but... that's a scene of some of my favorite photographs of yours. <laughs> it's hard to stay away from it. Yeah, the isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's and, enchanting. You know, just the shape of the volcano, it's, you know, the triangular shape. It mm -hmm. just lends itself to pictures, and they're so magnificent and so imposing. Um, and then Antigua, where we also have spent a lot of time, is a, an old colonial town. Mm -hmm. It was the second capital of Guatemala I see. Until, um, until an earthquake destroyed it and a volcano eruption destroyed it. But um, it's got about 30,000 people. Okay. Also surrounded by three volcanoes. So it's great. Both places have wonderful weather. The Mayan people are kind and gracious and reserved, but um, colorful in a way that they, their dress, um, they have a lot of them still wear traditional dress that's right. beautiful textures and patterns, and they just have a really nice manner about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that's a I I, I I could feel a lot of that also from your photographs. There's, there seems to be a real warmth and a um, so, something very genuine, and also you know I think like a lot of uh, country people from, from more agricultural places, they just uh, tend to be humble, unassuming. Yeah, exactly. I've been in touch with a few of our friends who live there, uh, indigenous Maya as well as Guatemalans who are not Maya, and um, there's a lot of discrimination against the Maya on mm -hmm. the part of the. Um, nonetheless, in my relationships with both groups of people, 
Um, you know, they they really tend to live in the moment. I mean, the younger generation obviously has been exposed to much more because sure. of the internet technology. So I think they're really concerned about their future. But, you know, uh, these people, our friends have been out of work now for two or three months. Right. And, you know, you know, it's just what we have to do. And we're doing fine. It's OK. We're with our family. And, um, you know, the day will come soon when we can get back to our lives. And there's doesn't seem to be a whole lot of angst right. and uh, pretty much being in the moment, I think. Mm hmm. So do, do, do you think that's more of an agricultural uh, influence or do you think it's uh, also maybe a spiritual influence from within the culture, just their, um, I don't know, theology, if you will, or their, you know, their view of life in terms of the, you know, of the cosmos that it just like, just <laughs> go with the flow, take it in stride? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, you know, I'm not an expert, but my guess is it would be all of, the above what you just mm -hmm. said. Okay. Well, you know, like, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Eric, please. Traditions that go back thousands of years, um, very, very close families, um, the agriculture, I think, where they're accustomed to seasons. So they know that, for instance, during the rainy season, which is going on right now, actually, um, it lasts for a while, that there are certain things that can be done and can't be done. So, but... Um, yeah, it's a combination of a lot of factors. Right. Well, you know, one thing I, I'd really like to ask, obviously, you know, um, the reason I thought of talking in the first place was because of your photographic work. So if you don't mind, can you kind of uh, give us some idea of when you first got the photo bug? Were you, you know, um, how did you get attracted to looking at photographs? When did you get motivated to take them? That kind of thing. Sure. So our family, when I was really young, had a little Kodak brownie, I believe. <laughs> I'm laughing I, because we had one of those, too. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I would take a few pictures with it, and mine always seemed to be fuzzy <clears throat> and not well composed particularly, and so I never gave photography much thought. When I was in high school, I'm Jewish, and I went with a Jewish youth group to the then Soviet Union. Okay. At an aunt who bought me a Kodak Instamatic. And the Instamatic, this one was a little more sophisticated than the typical model. And you could do a long shutter speed by holding down the shutter release button on it. Okay. So when I came back, it, it wasn't as though I was taking photography seriously, but other people on my trip were a group of teenagers. Um, had some pretty nice cameras. I remember one had a Nikon. And at any rate, when I came back and developed the film, people really responded to the pictures I had taken. And it's like, wow, this is, uh, that was kind of fun and maybe I should pursue it. And so I went out and bought my first decent camera was a Petri. I don't know if it's pronounced Petri or Petri. And a 35 millimeter film camera. I set up a dark room. And uh, I was living at my mother's house at the time, set up a dark room in the laundry room. And it was like instant love. I mm -hmm. mean, the dark room, when you see that first print coming up out of the developer. It's like magic, it's, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I was hooked. So how long ago would you would you guesstimate that that was? So that would have been 1973. OK. So were you like a teenager then or? Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. So, yeah, I was 17. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then I started to do photography pretty regularly. I bought a better camera, Canon, and went off to college and started working on the college newspaper. I was really, really lucky. Um, the university I went to, University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida, okay. had a day daily college newspaper and I became a staff photographer and later the photo editor. So I was basically out there photographing every day for a daily paper, which taught me deadlines, um, how to print in the dark room on, on deadline and caption writing, getting information, all of those things that going, go into being a photojournalist. Mm -hmm. So I got a pretty good foundation in college and it was pretty important. 
I see. Now, yeah. what, Go ahead. what what kind of things were you shooting at the time? I mean, just anything to support the needs of the paper, or did you have a particular interest that you were pursuing? Um, it was a little bit of both. I guess since I took up photography pretty seriously, which was right around that time, I've always enjoyed photographing basically everything. Mm -hmm. you know, I love um, that Gary Winogrand quote. <laughs> yeah. I photographed to see what things look like photographed. And, you know, for me is a little bit of the same and taking a little further. It's like whatever I thought would make an interesting photograph. And so maybe it would be a portrait. Maybe it would be a landscape. Maybe it would be a still life. Uh, maybe it would be a basketball game or, you know, a football game. So I loved photographing everything. Um, I did gravitate towards sports because I had always been a real sports freak mm -hmm. and photographing sports. And I did it for a number of years, um, starting in college. So that was always exciting, you know, front row seat, basically sitting under the basket at a basketball game or um, on the sidelines at a football game. And uh, it was I was also my first job out of college was I was hired as a staff photographer at the Tampa Tribune in Tampa, Florida. Mm -hmm. My first assignment was actually to photograph my graduation from college. <laughs> and oh. so um, instead of attending, I was there photographing at my first assignment. But it was also the infancy of sports taking off in Tampa professionally. There was a soccer team called the Tampa Bay Rowdies, which was in the North American Soccer League. And um, their first years of their pro football team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And so I was lucky to photograph, also photograph that. Also, college football is really big in Florida. So I was covering sure. University, of oh, yeah. University of Miami. Wasn't there also like a pro hockey team there, the Lightning or something? Um, the Lightning is there now. They weren't there at the time. Oh, okay. There was a pro team. But um, soccer was really big. Soccer, sure. thirty to 40,000 people a game. Okay. Uh, that was when the Cosmos of New York had Pele and Beckenbauer. Oh, yeah. Sure. It was, it was a pretty exciting time. I had never photographed um, soccer before, but it was great. And I really loved photographing football. And uh, baseball, there was spring training there. So there were lots of opportunities. But I also enjoyed photographing other things from news to uh, food, all kinds of things. It's one of the great things about working for a newspaper is the variety. Okay, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, were you early, in the early, early period, like around this time you're talking about now, were you more focused on the technical aspect of capturing the photos or uh, and or just kind of because your style to me is is kind of impressionistic, which I really like. I mean, so it's kind of like, you know, yeah, I know I'm seeing what what I'm seeing, but there's something that drove you to capture that and compose it that way. And then also taking it another another step further. There's also something that drove you in your processing to highlight what it is you felt and you saw and ultimately what you want us to see. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I think that um, the graphic foundation or the visual construction construction of an image has always been really important to me. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in shape, line, how light defines um, shapes and line. Um, you know, obviously, composition, all of those things are extraordinarily important to my pictures always have been. As a journalist, you throw in all these other things that are important to being a, a journalist who tells stories in a profound way, or at least a meaningful way. And that means sort of, you know, the moment, um, which can mean gesture, facial expression, interaction, all of those things. So my foundation is basically a combination of those two things, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, the strong visual aesthetic combined with moment. Um, as far as, like, being a little more technical about it, um, a lot of the things that I do now, now that I'm not in the journalism world anymore, um, 
those things are taboo in the world of journalism. I couldn't possibly right. do these anymore. And, you know, we shot black and white, but also um, I worked at the St. Petersburg Times, one of the top newspapers in Florida at the time, and we shot all transparency color slide film. So, you know, you've got it really teaches you the technical end of things as far as making the proper exposure, because you can't overexpose. You can't underexpose slide film. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be usable. Right. So and I like I said before, too, I was taught to print on deadline. So that teaches you pretty much to try and get it right in the dark room in a matter of seconds or sure. minutes. Sure. Uh, but also no manipulation really was allowed. Maybe some dodging, burning, darkening edges, adding some contrast. Um, photojournalists typically like to print more contrast even, say, their counterparts in the art world. Right. You know, photographers, I don't, well, Ansel Adams is an exception, but people like Robert Adams maybe, um, you know, their work tends to be a little bit on the, by a journal, a photojournalistic standard, um, a little flatter, a little less contrasty. Right. So, right more contrasty. I think that's really carried over to my work now. Um, oh, definitely. But I think that underlying foundation of a strong aesthetic um, now is what drives my work. Okay. One of the, one of the things I was really surprised, well, intrigued by, because, you know, in, initially, you know, I just, I'm, I'm a funny guy. I mean, I have not studied a lot of, uh, deliberately studied a lot of photographers per se. Gary Winogrand is probably one of the ones I definitely have. Uh, there's a few others, but for the most part, I'm just, I'm very open. I like what I like. I see what I see. And if something intrigues me, maybe I'll take a little extra effort to find out about this person or look for more of their work because, I, well, okay, that, you know, uh, that that was nice. Let me let me find some more interesting stimuli in that vein or with a similar inspiration, that kind of thing. So when uh, you know when you agreed uh, to come on the podcast, it was only then I just said, well, let me you know let me check. Okay, Eric's got some links here, and let me look at his blog. And oh, so he's shooting, I think, primarily with an iPhone now. I think exclusively. Is that correct? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. And you know, I happen to have an iPhone, and to be honest with you. I've done some work with it, but I've, I, I've struggled, but it's a, wow, you know, I love your stuff and I see what you're doing with it. So now it's like, okay, I'm going to make a real effort to <laughs> work with that iPhone and get to a point where I'm really comfortable and really doing work that I feel good about. I mean, sure, I could get good stuff on my old Pentax. I could get, you know, really nice stuff on the full frame Nikon. You know, that's, 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 that's not so hard. I mean, you know, that's not so challenging because you have, you know, such, you know, good lenses and sensors and whatnot. But, you know, I know that I know the iPhone's capable of good work. It just said, number one, the ergonomics of it. Uh, are you, are you primarily one handing it? Are you uh, like side, side button? Clicking yeah. yeah. Um, I try and do it with one hand. I mean, street photography, it's so much easier with one hand. Right. Okay. I quite a bit because it's a one-handed operation. You press on the screen, boom, right. there it is. Oh, so you're, then, you're pressing on the screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, that was with Hipstamatic. But then as the iPhones advanced, it didn't seem like Hipstamatic was necessarily keeping up. I don't know. Maybe I just had bad luck. But I was encountering some shutter lag. And I can't have shutter lag for the kind of photography I like to do for the most part. Right. On the screen. So, um, timing is important. So I switched back to the native iPhone for a lot of work, but I still use it in my left hand, pressing the volume up button. Right. You know, mm -hmm. damn it. Um, although if it's something a little more steadied and more, um, oh, not really moving where I have an opportunity, I use the button. Um, one thing, too, not that you asked about this, but there are a lot of great photo taking apps as well as editing apps out there. One of the things that I love about the iPhone is its simplicity. And the native camera in the iPhone allows me just the right amount of flexibility that I think I need, which is to control exposure, focus to a certain degree, but exposure is the main thing. And it's simple to use. So I, other than Hipstamatic, I don't use any other apps for making the picture. 
Um, getting back, though, to I think what you were saying, it's like as far as other cameras, I, I used to use a Leica when I was shooting film. Mm -hmm. I, I bought a Leica digital camera because it's not really in my budget. Right. Uh, but I look at the iPhone as kind of a, um, I don't know, a poor man's Leica in that I see with the iPhone pretty much the same way I saw with the Leica. Interesting. But ways that I didn't necessarily see with single lens, single lens reflex cameras are with digital single lens reflex cameras. Can you, um, can you expand on that just a little? I think I know where you're going, but can you, can you, do you think you can expand on that a little bit? Why, you know, what is it in terms of the, the image you're producing with the iPhone that you feel is sim, uh, kind of similar to the Leica? I, I think for whatever reason, it's a more intuitive response. And what happens is with a Leica or with the iPhone, I'm seeing the image, you know, in my mind, in my eye, in my heart, in my mind, all of those three places. Mm -hmm. at the, and the camera is merely an extension of that. Right. The SLR or the SLR doesn't operate the same way. It's mm -hmm. got to be up to your eye pretty much. Um, I know it's a little different now with with um, digital cameras where there's a screen, right. but nonetheless, it was also the simplicity of the Leica. Um, I never, I, I always used an M6, which was, um, you know, you set the shutter speed, you set the aperture, and the lenses on the Leica, like the 35 millimeter lens that I liked, had a little, I don't know what it's called, a thing on the lens where when you knew when it was in a certain position, it was focused at, say, seven feet. So it was this totally intuitive process. And the iPhone is the same thing. It's just a mere extension of, of what I'm seeing. And mm -hmm. I raise it up, and the image is there. Single lens reflex, you've got to bring it up to your eye. And then, typically, you're fumbling around trying to get the right exposure and, you know, the focus and all of that stuff, too. Right. So... I know that's going to sound like a, a lame sort of explanation to people who totally love their single lens reflex cameras, but I just find it analogous to the way I used and the way I saw with the Leica using the iPhone. That, that's it's, fine. I mean, it's intuitive. It's fast. The quality sucks. But well, you know, way. this is a thing. I mean, because, you know, I could tell just from your work that you're not a gearhead, and I'm not a gearhead, and a lot of people are. And I mean, then, then that's fine. I mean, everyone has their thing, but but the the thing that I see, you know, with people that are really really in touch with their craft, you know, it's it's just like the tool becomes an extension of them, and they're not they're not cut up on the tool. It's just like this is my tool. I'm comfortable with it. It's an extension of my hand. It's an extension of my mind, even. And so it's like you know we're in sync, and I just use it. And, 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 you know, I don't get obsessed about it. I don't, I don't hold it in like, oh, you know, you're such a wonderful tool. Let me buy you a cup of coffee or, you know, take you on a date. It's just like, you know, we're partners. You know, we have this, you have this unique bond and relationship and it works and just keep going forward with it. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, they're all tools and they do different things. And one thing that I've tried to do well, when I had the Leica and now with the iPhone is I try and take advantage of what it is and not necessarily try and make it into something that it's not or can never be because mm -hmm. that wouldn't. I mean, it's one thing I've always operated simply, even when I was using, you know, like the high end Canons, the um, both film and digital. They're beautiful cameras. I mean, Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fuji, they all make incredible cameras. I mean, sure. these things find how, how wonderful they are. But I always tried to keep it simple. I preferred um, prime lenses to zoom lenses. Now, there were times when zoom lenses were more appropriate, and I had them in my bag. But right. I always put like a 35 and an 85 operate, or a 24 sometimes. Yeah. Because to me, it just simplified life. And sure. in most cases, I could take a step forward or a step back or a Foot step zoom. to the right, which is what photographers maybe should think about doing anyway. Right. But with zooms and all of the things that the camera can do for you, we get really lazy. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because to me, 
um, this makes things so much more simpler, but it also, it gives me so much more flexibility. Right. But I also, there are pictures I can't make. I mean, I can't really do wildlife picture with an iPhone sure. unless I have attachment, you know. Um, but typically that's not the kind of picture I'm making anyway. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, with with me, I mean, I'm primarily a street photographer, but of course, I love I love photography. So it's not going to be oh, I'm out here in the wilderness, but there's not a person around, so I can't shoot anything. No, um, but ultimately, because I do live in an urban environment, and mm. um, I'm you know I'm just very attracted to the human because it always gives everything such context, um, and I think that's one of the reasons I love you know, shooting street photography because, you know, I love shooting people and I just prefer candid to posed. I mean, not that there's not beautiful posed and, and portrait shots. Uh, it's just that to me, there's something magical about uh, a stolen moment of something real. Um, and I'm not looking to be a voyeur and kind of like, oh, you know, that, you know, I found two people doing something that's usually behind closed doors and people don't see. Not that kind of thing at all, but just... You know, something innocent, something pure, an expression, a uh, combination of expression and clothing maybe, you know, the the, the, the silhouette, the, um, you know, the angle, the lighting, you know, all, all of those things. So with the, with the, the thing I love about the, the challenge, and I've been inspired and, and kind of indirectly challenged by you because I have the phone on me, I've shot with it, but now it's like, okay, if this guy is like, you know, basically uh committed himself to only using that and it's on me all the time and there's a lot of times now where i'm going out in the morning to exercise and i only bring the iphone and it's tucked away and then you know after i finish uh, doing my routine i get on my bike and usually come home but uh this last few days i went to a big market nearby like really really early when the vendors are still setting up and i broke out the iphone i'm like okay i want to i want to keep doing it until I get comfortable with this thing and I'm feeling, you know, I'm making the connection. It's not, it, you know, until it, I just want to keep doing it until it becomes intuitive to where I don't have to think about it so much. And, you know, so I, I could see myself getting there more and more. Now, now, once I do the image capturing, of course, now the other key factors, I've got to process it in a way to where it looks acceptable to me. I realize, no, it's not, it's not the DSLR and it's not, those, you know, those kind of prime lenses, and that's okay. But I need to, you know, learn how to process these images, adjust the contrast, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I'm getting there. In the last cup, the last round, I think I found, I'm, uh, I'm finding the right mix. You know, at first I was just loading them directly into the uh, computer and, and then uh, processing them on Photoshop. And now this last batch, I processed them in the phone, uh, I think on Snapseed. I think that's yes. right. Yeah. And I processed process, process them there, uploaded them, and then I found, you know, the contrast, I still needed to give it a little bump. So I did that in um, uh, Photoshop with, uh, I, 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 oh, uh, it's not silver effects, uh, I think color effects, one of the, or Viviza, yeah, uh, one of the uh, color effects uh, series of apps. And I'm like, whoa, I'm really, I could see it it's actually coming out in a way that I can really be happy with it. And so I'm encouraged and I want to keep going. So I appreciate you for that. I, I realize that's not what you were setting out to do, but uh, you, <laughs> you've had a good influence on me. Oh, good. Um, you know, inspiring other people is um, something that's very meaningful to me. So, yeah, <laughs> you know. yeah. And, you know, I've told you before, and, you know, I'll give links to your stuff and I'll let people judge for themselves. But, you know, one thing I really like about your stuff, I, I, I you know, some of your images are just really poetic. And I'm like, whoa, you know. And, you know, it's funny. It's like I don't photograph like you. I don't know that I ever will. You know, I'm inspired by your stuff. But, you know, it, you know, it's like I play guitar. And when I hear some, like, really awesome guitars what I'll call like my idol. It's almost like I love the I love their stuff so much, but it's almost like I feel like smashing my guitar. Well, <laughs> you know, I love your stuff so much, but I don't feel like smashing my iPhone. I feel like embracing the tool and making the stuff that represents me better. Yeah. I mean, that's the best approach, I think, is everybody sees differently what's going to appeal to you both visually as well as to your heart, you know, uh, 
kind of message you want to get across of any. And, you know, photography doesn't have to have a message. If it does, it's, it's great. Um, but you put a lot out there. And one thing I just want to go back to very quickly sure. is one way to look at the iPhone is like you have a frame in your hand and mm -hmm. you're putting around a piece of something. I mean, that's kind of what I'm getting at that I, how I saw with the Leica and okay. how I, like a frame. But the, the, po the editing is so, so important too. And by editing, I mean the selection of the pictures. And I don't personally see anything wrong with, with taking a lot of uh, images. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Storage is cheap. Why not do it? This is the technology. Take advantage of it. Um, but editing and picking the right frame is is super super important mm -hmm. and then the thing of it um my wife cass who's a brilliant photographer also in her own right she's she says she likes the image to speak to her and lead it to where it wants to be i'm not quite that esoteric but i do believe in playing around and one of the and experimenting and one of the things i love about using snapseed on the phone is it allows me a lot of room to play Photoshop is an amazing, um, is amazing software. Mm -hmm. I, it's just, but I don't like using it. It's a pain to me. I'm moving a mouse around, whereas using Snapseed on my phone, it's tactile. It's like being back in the dark room. I've got my finger on the phone and I'm playing and having fun and enjoying it and trying different things. Snapseed is, it, it is an amazingly powerful tool. Mm -hmm. It's got a hit got a history brush it's got so much that you can do i don't tap into probably more than 25 percent of it you just named a few features i've never used so now i feel like maybe i'm using even less than that um yeah there's a little bit of a learning curve to it they do have some tutorials i could show you a couple of things okay. too i mean the most important thing is within each one like to an image you know there's the, the drop down menu mm -hmm. um but then I have to look at my phone to see exactly. I should know since I've been using it for years. But there is a history. And you can selectively go into the history, delete one step if you want. Or ah, okay. you can selectively apply what you did to the entire image to just a small part by using a brush and applying it. And, you know, my point is twofold. Number one, that... It's it's um, a powerful tool, and number two for me, it's really fun to use. It's it's like I said, tactile. You're yeah. actively involved in making it be what you want it to be, taking it to where you feel you can take it. Um, you know, all of that said, earlier I made a comment about the quality of the iPhone. Obviously, it's not a high-end Sony, Canon, Nikon, Fuji. Sure, it's Choose. It's got artifacts, it's got noise, grain, all of the, well, no grain, um, artifacts and noise. And I find ways to get around it sure. and to utilize. One of those things that I do, particularly in black and white, is in Snapseed, I'll apply if I'm going to make a print. I don't typically do this if I'm just posting it on Instagram, but if I'm going to make a, I'll put a little bit of a grain using Snapseed, put the grain on the image. And the grain is much more pleasing to look at than artifacts and noise. Right. And then sharpen the grain, and it looks like a print that I made 35 years ago in the darkroom. It's got that same kind of quality. And it's a, it's a visually pleasing quality, too. It's not, you know, like, oh, my God, look at that ugly noise. Right. It's like that grain looks super cool. You, you also add a bit of texture to your images um, as well. Is that correct? Yeah, it depends on the image. Sure. I mean, I there are a couple of hipstamatic um, filter combinations that I like that put uh, texture on. I used to use textures more. Now it's more a matter of I'm well. First of all, in in both Mexico and Guatemala, there's a lot of texture in the backgrounds, the walls. Right. Mainly, I don't necessarily find that so much. Like at least here in Philadelphia, and so. A lot of times I'll try and bring out that texture even more to emphasize it. Mm -hmm. So typically I'll use in Snapseed, um, it's called Structure, which it's kind yeah. of adding and sharpening at the same time. Sure. And then I'll 
too. Um, I also will use other tools like selectively, like Glamour Glow, which, you know, has this horrible sounding name. Yeah. But also adds contrast and can add a softness depending on the image. Mm -hmm. So too much texture, too much detail, it can sort of smooth it over in a very pleasing way. Right, right. Yeah, it's meant, that, that particular effect is meant to, uh, you know, for portrait work to just kind of, yeah, you yeah. know, just bring it all together in a, in a, in a pleasant way. Yeah, it's more forgiving. It is, absolutely, yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, um, this, this is really good to good to know because like i said it's it's something that's always been in the back of my mind i mean sure you know i love i love the nikon but to to be honest with you you know schlep it around um you know when you when you purpose to do that okay you're prepared for it uh yeah i tend to uh, not want to you know bring the zooms with it certainly not the uh, the one that goes to 300 because that's a bit of weight uh you know it's more comfortable with the 35 and i like that i like that focal length anyway but you know the iphone is always there and it's like, okay, you know, exactly. why not utilize it? Why not, you know, I mean, let's put it, you know, uh, in simple terms. You know, I want to master it, you know, for the simple reason that I am a photographer. It is capable of doing good photographs. It's just you have to work with it. And, uh, you know, you, you have to make friends with it, and it will make friends with you like any like any tool. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. It's, um, I mean, ultimately, it is a tool. But why not try and learn that tool the best you can and use it, you know, to your advantage? You know, I carried around big, heavy cameras for years. And they're, like I said before, they're great. But, you know, my body just can't take that anymore. Right. And is it's always there. It's always in my pocket. I, I would also say no matter which camera you're carrying around, whether it's an iPhone or, you know, a, a, a great Nikon, um, to me, one of the foundations, the keys, is to pay attention. And so if what interests you is making interesting photographs, strong photographs, compelling photographs, it's really a matter of paying attention no matter what you're doing and where you are. Um, it can become a bit obsessive, but nonetheless, um, you know, like a lot of my pictures are done just in the course of my daily life. Uh, my wife and I walk everywhere. We don't have a car and we live in places where, you know, we never want to have a car or need a car. Mm -hmm. And so everywhere. And most pictures are made while we're walking. Right. You know, but it's a matter of truly paying attention and not being, uh, I, I mean, and, and that doesn't mean well, that I'm always thinking in terms of making a picture, but when I see something maybe further up the street or to my right or left looking around or an interesting looking person. You have to be I'm going ready. slow. Yeah, yeah. And you're prepared also, you know. Um, you have to have your equipment ready to go. Mm -hmm. So you can think about the iPhone. It's in my hand. Very rarely is it in my pocket when I'm walking. It's right. in my hand. And boom, you know, I raise it up and, and there's the image. There, there's another element to that too, especially for street, because like I have a friend um, that uses like uh, was it the Rico GR two or the yeah. GR three, and those are nice little cameras by all means. Yeah. The only thing is, it's still a camera, and when you're doing street photography and, and you want something candid, I mean, gr granted, it's not going to attract the same attention that a big honking Nikon or camera, you know, with a with a big lens on it will, but it's still a camera form. Now with a phone. Phones are so ubiquitous now that if you've got your phone out in your hand, even when you're getting pretty close to someone, they're not necessarily distracted by it and they're not threatened by it because, well, you know, everyone has phones and there's a guy with a phone, so whatever. You know, it's happening at a subconscious level, so you, you get much uh, higher percentage of uh, people remaining in the moment, remaining in, in, in their little world, and you're not, not you know, pulling them, pulling them out of it by accident. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, I think people are becoming more wary of the phone because they equate that to something that's going to be online very quickly. Mm -hmm. But still, it does not arouse, you know, the attention, the suspicion of of a bigger camera. And like you said, even the small little thing like the Ricoh, um, you know, the iPhone is less imposing. It's right. less. 
yeah, people are not going to get. I, I also, when I'm out, you know, walking around, I typically look a bit like a goofball. I mean, I've got a hat on, a <laughs> tourist, or you know, particularly in Guatemala, I'm clearly a tourist. Right. And you know, it's it's less of a threat, I guess, than if you're wearing a you know a photo vest and you've got two cameras and you've got a big zoom lens sticking out of one of the vest pockets. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. How how do you feel about um, the 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 iPhone performance at night? Do you do much shooting well, at night? Well, it's pretty interesting. You know, this this latest iOS um, has the night mode, mm -hmm. and I experimented with it, um, and I really like some of the results. It does some pretty interesting things. How it chooses to put all these different kind of frames together. It's not just making a long exposure. I mean, that it, it leads you to believe it's like making a three second exposure. It's not that at all. It's actually stitching together um, from the tests I've done anyway, stitching together various images, but there's one um, image. So you're talking, so, about the you're talking about the live mode, right? Uh, not the live mode, the night mode. Okay. So, um, like I have the 11 Pro Max, which is the most recent version. Right. Don't know of any of the other models. Like, if you have a ten, or even just the regular eleven, whether the night night mode works on those, I'm not sure. I thought it was the latest iOS operating system, but maybe not. But yeah. at any rate, under extraordinarily low light, um, it puts together something remarkable. Hmm. I, I'm, boy, I was using it quite a bit when we were in Guatemala. Um, shooting at night because the light there at night is really fascinating. They have these, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but the kind of light, typically street lights go sort of green. Um, at dusk, it's beautiful, a deep purple sky behind it. Wow. So really well. Um, I can send you a link to some of those pictures okay. because um, at any rate, so this for me is a major upgrade as far as shooting at night because previously it was pretty much useless. Right. For, I, I did have an app for a while that made multiple exposures or a time, I'm sorry, a time exposure, but you know, the subject's moving, it's not going to work. Whereas right. the night mode phone somehow most of the time still freezes the motion, even under really, really low light. Are you familiar at all with a Japanese photographer named Daido? I believe it's Daido Moriyama. I am. Okay. Yeah. He's yeah, Remarkable. I, I was thinking with the with the iPhone at night, it, it it's it makes it easier to get that kind of a a feel to your images, uh, you know, just kind of um, uh, kind of noisy and, and and blurry. I mean, you know, but some of them can be really beautiful, sure. So I don't yeah. think I have the night mode, and I I've got an older seven, so I don't I, I don't think it's in this hardware, um, but uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll investigate some more. But yeah, that's that that sounds interesting. But even even so, I feel like okay, w w even with its limitations, I want to get in there and master it within its limitations and do the best I can within its limitations. So I, I know I still have room to grow and improve there. Yeah, there is an app that um, supposedly simulates um, Dido's uh, photography with the high contrast. Undoubtedly, <laughs> undoubtedly, sure. But yeah. I mean, just out of curiosity, uh, do you, do you have a particular favorite? I, I know you mentioned Gary Winograd. Is there any uh, any other photographers in particular that um, that from time to time you go back to and review their work, or you can you know sometimes think about them when you're out uh, capturing your own images? Um, yeah, most definitely. I mean, I would not call myself an expert in the history of photography, but I have studied it. To some degree, is you know, since I made my profession from photography, sure. I need um, what's preceded me, and um, you know, all the, I mean, through the history of photography, there have just been so many amazing photographers mm -hmm. who have broken new ground, done incredible work. You know, the, all the typical favorites are my favorites as well. You know, Cartier Bresson, Robert Frank, Dorothy, um. And then there are some more obscure photographers. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm drawing a blank right now. But, okay. you know, typically the, the ones who are known 
most well known and they're most well known for a reason because their work stands out from the rest. Right. Um, Instagram, man, there is so much incredible work out there too. Um, I know there's a lot of criticism of Instagram because there's a lot of bad work sure. there. If you kind of just follow or look at the work that's good, then you can limit it. Um, I also, to me, art, literature, music, movies, um, sculpture, every art form has been an influence on me. And when I'm out photographing, I think all of those things come together. Yep. Oh, I know um, Ray Metzger is a photographer um, who did a lot of work in Philadelphia. George Krauss, um, Aaron Siskin, Harry Callahan, um, Tina Modati, you know, all these people who like a lot of photographers know about, but they're not generally known to the, the public. Mm -hmm. So all of these influences when I'm out photographing, I think are kind of roaming around in my brain as I'm looking. You just touched on one point that I think strikes a chord uh, within me as well, because I, I think there's something about the artistic muse, if you will, or the artistic impulse. And, and that is sometimes I'll find if I'm listening to music and really getting into it, I, I could pick up a guitar, but sometimes like, wait, I'm listening to this music. I have to pick up my camera. I want to go do something with my camera. Or maybe I'm looking at photographs. I'm like, you know what? I need to go put certain tunes on because it, it's it's like morphing. It's like just that artistic impulse, but like one need to take a slightly different path. Does that can you relate to that at all? Absolutely. I mean, when I listen to the music that I really love, and which I is, admire, can you give us an example of some of some of your favorite music? Be, all the stuff I listened to growing up, like Dylan and the Stones, mm -hmm. and the. But when I listen to Bob Dylan, for example, I am. I just want to jump up and after the song is over, <laughs> jump up and go outside and photograph because he inspires me. He inspires me to see life in a different way. He inspires me to be poetic. That he makes such perfect sense because like, here we go. You just said poetic. I said poetic. There's such a, a poetic nature, and Bob Dylan is such an excellent poet. So, you know, I, I could see that totally. There's a really good interview with him, by the way, that just came out in the New York Times, and it was done by Douglas Brinkley, who is the presidential historian mm -hmm. and the son of a um, really interesting interview with Dylan. Um, but but anyway, and, you know, also um, I've in re more recent years started listening more to blues and. Um, well, you, you saw I, you saw my Skype panel, didn't you? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Brooklyn blues, man. So oh. I definitely like the blues. Yeah. And, you know, flamenco, fado, classical guitar. I mean, all of those yeah. things. And they all they all inspire. Sure, me. sure. It's just, you know, go to a museum. I mean, music is unique. I think music, music is, it's one, the one art form that can truly bring people together. Um, other art forms, I think, don't necessarily work on the same level. Right. Uh, work in different ways. Um, but nonetheless, that said, I mean, reading great, great uh, literature are, uh, I've actually done a couple of projects, by the way, speaking of literature, um, Ulysses by James Joyce, oh. uh, original manuscript is here in a museum in Philadelphia. And the manuscript's a work of art in itself because Joyce was going blind as he was writing it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an angle. Um, but at any rate, I did a project. Uh, my wife and I went to Dublin and kind of photographed a contemporary framework for Ulysses. And so the pictures were accompanied by passages out of the book. And then we also did a thing. We went to Spain and Rome through La Mancha to do a thing on Don Quixote, wow. where we took Don Quixote like statue and a Sancho Panza puppet, photographed them in the landscape. So, you know, for me, there's a lot of crossover as far as um, trying to combine what's inspired me in other mediums and try and do something with it photographically. Great. You know, I think uh, I'm going to probably, uh, I'm getting ideas uh, with the iPhone as I, as I get more comfortable with it. You know, there's so many uh, traditional Chinese temples out here and I think I'd really like to kind of, you know, get inside of them with that. So it's not, 
well, you know, here's the white guy with the camera uh, kind of thing, just kind of, you know, where I could be more of a fly on the wall and mm -hmm. and uh, and get and get a little bit more creative with it and just kind of flow with it a little bit. And I think there's uh, some potential for some really interesting um, images, more impressionistic kind of stuff. That's really what I'd like to see happen a little bit more is like to be able to make the connection between uh, more impressionistic thoughts that I have and being able to produce them uh, on the page or in the screen, if you will. Yeah, um, it sounds like a great project to work on. And maybe one one direction you could think about taking is what kind of toning might be appropriate for what you're feeling about the subject matter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe that's just a straightforward toning, or maybe it's something that, that evokes um, some memories that you in particular have when you're when you're in those places <clears throat> we have a friend uh, an amazing photographer in philadelphia um, who did large format black and white huge prints and he went to japan fairly recently to photograph and sort of with a digital camera and he ended up doing something totally unlike him but he photographed at night and moving the camera around to do these kind of impressionistic time exposures oh. and extraordinarily moody and um you know i i think it worked but it was highly unlike his other pictures that he'd done for years um but he experimented and found something that he felt was evocative of what he was feeling right right well you know it, it's, it's been such a pleasure talking to you um you know so much uh, good information you shared, and uh, I'm really glad I ha I'll have the opportunity to share some of your information uh, with the with the people, and I'll certainly give you a link and by all means share it with uh, some of your followers and let them find out a little bit more about the man behind the camera and some of the thoughts and impressions and uh, that go into uh, producing uh, producing that art. So. Just really want to thank you for coming on, um, and uh, I'll let you know when the show is up and and uh, out there. So, yeah, okay. it's it's been great having you on a connector. Uh, I never did mention that actually. I I know you're from Philly. Uh, well, you could probably guess I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, I was in. I think the first time I was in Philly, I went with my mother and a friend to go um, hear some jazz, some Latin jazz, as it, as it were. I think it was uh, Afro Cuban jazz. Uh, I forget the club, but it was a, a guy named Mongo Santa Maria. I don't know if you ever heard of him. No. Yeah. Great name. Yeah, great name. Yeah, <laughs> he's uh, he was uh, quite a timbali player. But anyway, well, Eric, right. thank thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you so much for having me and for asking such provocative uh, questions. Um, really appreciate it. Makes it uh, makes me really think about what I want to say and have to say about photography. Well, that's so, great. Thank you. That's great. You're quite welcome.